It's the 24th of October, 2015, and this is episode 258. This show is intended for informational and educational purposes only. Cryptocurrency is new, exciting, and empowering, but we're not experts, just obsessed companions walking the road towards a more peer-to-peer future. On today's episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin, I'm here with Stephanie Murphy. Hey. And Andreas M. Antonopoulos. Hi, everyone. So we've got a good mix of topics for today's discussion. We're going to dig into the first ever sidechain by Blockstream, I guess just a little over a year after that first white paper came out. And then we'll end today's session talking about the recent transaction malleability attack, which was a variation of the same attack that uh, really, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Triggered the Gox. Yeah, exactly. That that goxed Mount Gox yeah. and has been back in the network news recently. This week, Blockstream announced the launch of Liquid. This is a pre-announcement for presumed product launch in Q1 of 2016. Liquid is the first production sidechain, which is intended to be a sidechain for use by exchanges in the Bitcoin space in order to allow for transfers between exchanges and between customer exchanges on a completely separate sidechain from Bitcoin. The general idea here is that unlike the current environment where each exchange runs their own private database for off-blockchain transactions in order to enable rapid trading and settlement of their order book, in this new model, exchanges would take Bitcoin off the Bitcoin blockchain using a multi-signature uh, structure would put it onto the liquid uh, sidechain where blocks would be essentially not mined but signed by a collaborative multi-signature process between all of the exchanges that are involved and the end result would be very very rapid transaction processing times on a complete sidechain so all of the stuff that used to be in off blockchain private databases on a single exchange keeping the liquidity concentrated on a single exchange now you can have shared liquidity between multiple exchanges six exchanges in fact have already expressed interest in signing up with this presumably that would allow for much faster arbitrage between exchanges now at the moment if you want to take money out of one exchange in Europe and put it into another exchange in the United States, you'd have to go six confirmations out of one exchange, six confirmations into the other, about two hours in order to transfer money. With uh, Liquid Sidechain, you could do this in a matter of seconds or minutes. What that would allow you to do is arbitrage, which would presumably bring the exchange rate pricing differences between exchanges down significantly and allow them to pool all of their liquidity to allow for a much better trading environment. Arguably, this also means that a lot of the transactions that are in private databases end up being on a public sidechain that provides some auditability or accountability and effectively allows exchanges to pool their resources together, but also create checks and balances on each other. So this is a really interesting application for sidechains. It seems to be much better than the off-blockchain approach of traditional private closed exchanges, and at the same time more transparent, secure, and private than the permissioned ledger systems that we see many of the banks implementing. So we'll see. This is still in the early planning phases and due for launch Q1 2016. Okay, so I have a couple of questions about this because I was chatting with uh, Nick Rathman and Devin Weller about uh, what kind of this means and whether or not it's something that's the sidechains are attractive for us to use with Tokenly. And uh, a couple of things came up. One, how is this different than a permissioned ledger, just kind of generally speaking? Because it doesn't use miners, it doesn't use proof of work, and it doesn't use merged mining, which were things that were, I thought, in kind of the uh, initial proposal we were seeing for sidechains. This doesn't use any of those things. So what is, what's actually different about it than a, just a normal permission ledger? I think one of the key differences is that this has a two-way peg to the Bitcoin blockchain, meaning that all of the funds that are on this sidechain come from the Bitcoin blockchain and eventually return to the Bitcoin blockchain, which means that you get, as promised by sidechains, this is the whole point of sidechains, is that when you do a two-way peg to something like Bitcoin, you get a lot of the uh, guarantees of the Bitcoin network essentially by proxy on the sidechain, meaning that Unlike a permission ledger, you can't create money out of thin air. 
you have to peg it to a specific amount of Bitcoin that's actually on the blockchain. And you can always return it back to the blockchain when you want. The other thing I think that is very different is that most of the permission ledger proposals we've seen are closed, whereas this would be a public blockchain. You will be able to create transactions on it and, and view it, and it's open for any exchange to participate. I think that's another big difference. Finally, the third interesting one is that the liquid sidechain is going to be using confidential transactions from the get-go, which means that it will deliver a fairly high degree of privacy for the participants in this uh, sidechain. Unlike permissioned ledgers, which essentially become a giant honeypot for any hacker who can come along or any internal employee who leaks the entire trading history of whoever's using the permissioned ledger. Permissioned ledgers are not very secure. Wouldn't that just be negated by the fact that all these sidechains are going to be tied to exchanges that are going to be doing AML, KYC stuff anyway? Well, the exchanges may be doing AML, KYC at the edge on their own customers and the transactions they put on the sidechain, but you will not be able to attach that AML, KYC, at least by viewing the public blockchain, to specific transactions because of the use of confidential transactions. And so the source, destination, and amounts are encrypted in confidential transactions. And as a result, you can't just leak the information. Whereas if you have a permission ledger that's doing AML KYC, if you leak the, the company's database and the ledger itself, then you basically have the entire transaction history of anyone who's ever participated. So this is one of those situations where it's more decentralized on that scale, but it still isn't tremendously decentralized. It seems like it is centralized on those six exchanges or, or however many exchanges they wind up eventually having, but that is compared to it being centralized on each single exchange uniquely. And so in that way, this is definitely a step forward in terms of spreading out the risk and making it so that if somebody is attacked, actually that, that's, you know, they can't get the money out. They have to attack everybody in order to compromise that sort of thing. So it brings the benefits of multi-sig to a permissioned ledger is as near I can tell that that's the advantage here, right? Well, that's the beginning of it, but I mean, Blockstream has repeatedly expressed a roadmap that has different mechanisms for proof of work or um, for consensus on the blockchain. This is the first implementation of that consensus on this sidechain. It's not necessarily going to remain that way. A lot of the sidechain's functionality at the moment is restricted by what's possible to do on the Bitcoin blockchain. Theoretically, in the future, if you have some small protocol level changes on the Bitcoin blockchain that allow you to do sidechains more effectively, you could have a much more secure approach to sidechains than using trusted intermediaries or multi-sig or these modified consensus mechanisms. The other thing to keep in mind is that this deals with two fundamental problems. The first problem is the, is the fact that each exchange right now is an island of liquidity with no ability to arbitrage. And that means that the overall liquidity in trading across exchanges is very, very low. Especially if you're in a country that, do, that has only one exchange or has very small exchange or access to exchanges, the amount of liquidity that you can trade on Bitcoin is pitiful and, and really puts a damper on price discovery and stability. It creates volatility and all kinds of problems. The other issue that you're addressing, which I think is very serious, is goes back to perhaps the conversation we're going to have next. But goes back to, to the lessons of Gox. So on Gox, you had Willybot that was trading. And from all of the accounts so far, it appears that on several occasions, Carpellus or someone else inside went and made a simple change in the database that increased the balance of specific accounts like Willybot's account, allowing them to trade Bitcoin that didn't exist essentially creating artificial supply of Bitcoin and, and going all fractional reserve on the blockchain. And the only reason you can do that is because it's a completely closed private database. It's a SQL database. And so anyone can change any number they want. That's a fundamental problem that needs to be solved. So the improvement from completely off blockchain private databases to a shared sidechain that depends on a multi-sig that's pegged to Bitcoin, uh, that significantly reduces the risk of this kind of reserve exchange where you're trading Bitcoin that doesn't actually exist. Sure. This definitely smells like progress and smells like, you know, a step along that path going towards totally trustless, if we still want to use that word after our conversation with Nick Zabo, side chains. 
One question that I have that I'm not sure if you're going to know the answer to, Andreas, because the two-way peg is basically a multi-sig where all of the different exchanges that are participating have one of the keys, what happens when a new exchange joins? And the other part of this question is, does an exchange need to apply in order to join this? Or can, can they just you know decide, hey, I'm going to participate in this and not have to ask for permission? Is Blockstream the one who determines who gets into these sidechains? Yes. So for now, this is mediated by Blockstream and through the use of a multisig, from what I understand, which even Blockstream, I think, says is not ideal and is not their idea of what the end goal will be, but it is an intermediate step until you can have full sidechains compatibility with, with Bitcoin that allows you to do this in a trustless way that doesn't centralize control. For now, it is that. It is the case that it's based on a multi-sig and Blockstream acts as a mediator. This is a commercial product that, that Blockstream will offer. So we'll have to see how it evolves over time. Certainly Blockstream's vision as expressed in the sidechains white paper and their various blog postings seems to be that this is just an intermediary step towards a broader implementation of a trustless sidechain. Interestingly enough, it's also the first step you would need towards uh, implementing something that looks very similar to voting pools, as proposed by Open Transactions, uh, Monetas, and uh, and other people who've been doing work in this in this space, like uh, Justice Ramvier. You know, very interesting work on how you can create environments where exchanges have to act in concert, and therefore, when you pool the liquidity and put it under the control of multiple exchanges, it makes it much more difficult for any exchange to run away with the money. Distributes the control over that money. I think the most interesting thing about this is that what we've seen so far in the space has been a promise of a fairly significant and very innovative technology, the, the concept of a two-way pegged sidechain. But that promise has only expressed itself in a white paper. And you can't really see what the implications of that will be until you have running code. Running code is the litmus test of open source prototype, deliver, and run code. That's what matters. So the white paper, fascinating. It got everybody's interest. It gave people something to talk about. But what's interesting with Liquid is that it really looks like in the first part of 2016, we're going to have the first example of running code, and then we can look at specifics and see really what sidechains can do in this industry. Today's episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin is brought to you by the LTB Network, where we're currently looking to hire an assistant developer to help us further improve our site and service. Interested applicants should be familiar with Linux command line interfaces, have basic knowledge of Git source control, and be comfortable working with MySQL, PHP data objects, object-oriented programming, HTML and CSS standards, and a few other specifics about our system. Check out the show notes of episode 258 to find the full list of attributes we're looking for, or jump right to our open source GitHub at github.com slash tokenly slash tokenly dash CMS. Compensation is negotiable, and interested parties should contact david at letstalkbitcoin.com with the subject line, developer wanted. We look forward to hearing from you. And today's magic word is dev. That's D-E-V. Dev, we look forward to hearing from you. <laughs> You've got until the 31st of October to visit letstalkbitcoin.com or the Let's Talk Bitcoin iOS app to enter it for your share of the listener rewards. Thanks for listening. Bitcoin problems to me always are much more difficult to understand when they are abstract and when I'm trying to understand it because I want to understand it rather than because it's something that is really affecting me. And so it's been interesting over the last couple of weeks because the transaction malleability attack, which we first talked about back when, uh, you know, when the, the kind of hole was discovered at Mt. Gox, has reemerged with something of a vengeance over the last two months. And this time it has affected me very personally because of the stuff we're doing with Tokenly and the vending machines that we're operating. And so I know a lot more about it now and I understand it much better than I did before. And I wanted to kind of uh, chat with you guys about it. Just to give an idea of how the transaction malleability attack works, as far as I understand, and again, I could be perhaps wrong, the way that it works basically is that when you send a Bitcoin transaction, that transaction has a transaction ID that is created at the same time that the transaction is created. When uh, your transaction gets into a block, then that transaction ID is permanently associated with that transaction. 
And this is relevant because services like SwapBot or like Mt. Gox's withdrawal service pay attention to that transaction ID. That's how they track, you know, if a transaction has confirmed. You look for the transaction ID, see how many confirmations it has, and that tells you pretty much everything that you need to know. The transaction malleability attack basically is where you as a bad actor are watching the Bitcoin blockchain and as transactions hit the network, you create duplicate transactions that actually just like send a fraction of a Bitcoin to yourself, but pay a miner's fee that have the same transaction ID because you can actually set the transaction ID. And if your transaction, your fake one gets into the block first, then the one that somebody actually sent that had that transaction ID that, that'll have a different transaction ID in the blockchain. So because somebody took the one that they thought they were going to get, the ID actually changes. And so the problem with this, it, what happened in Mt. Gox, as I now understand it a little bit more clearly, is that people would do withdrawals, and then the withdrawals would actually process, but the transaction malleability attack would cause them to have a different transaction ID in the blockchain than the one that Gox's servers were looking for. And so they say, oh, well, because we can't find the transaction that we thought that we sent, which you know is actually in there under a different transaction ID, we'll just send another because we think that that one failed. And then that happens over and over and over again. It's only when the person who's trying to change the transaction ID of the, of the deposit, you know, it's when they fail and the real one gets in first, that's the only time that Mt. Gox's system could actually see that, oh, this transaction successfully, this uh, withdrawal successfully processed and everything was finished. They only actually noticed when they ran out of money because they kept doing <laughs> withdrawals until the hot wallet emptied and the hot wallet should have had balance x and instead it was empty and that's the only reason they noticed just to interject some technical please stuff here uh, to provide an explanation transaction malleability really is the ability to change a transaction in a way that doesn't change it functionally but changes its fingerprint so a transaction ID is a fingerprint. It's a SHA-256 hash of the transaction. It's an inverted double hash, actually, but bottom line, it's a, it's a cryptographic fingerprint of the transaction. And so when you fingerprint a transaction, what you're doing is you're capturing all of the data that's in the transaction and expressing that as a long string of alphanumeric digits in, in hexadecimal, for example, which is the transaction ID or hash. And you can see that if you look at the Block Explorer and you look at a transaction, you'll see that it's named, indexed, referenced always by this long string of digits. That's its fingerprint. Now that hash is calculated on the data that's in the transaction, but not all the data that's in the transaction. And the reason for that is because when you're calculating the transaction, what you're doing is you're hashing all of the parts that, that you sign and then you provide a signature, but the signature doesn't sign itself, if you see what I mean. The signature cannot sign itself. It signs everything else. And so there's a lot of different opportunities there to change the way the signature is processed, change the way the uh, signature script is, is written in such a way that it doesn't change any of the other data in the transaction, and the signature is still valid. It still goes from the same source to the same destination address. It still has the same amounts that it's spending and the same amounts that it's creating as outputs, the same fee. Nothing changes in the transaction from a practical or functional standpoint. You're still paying, you know, five millibits for a cup of coffee and it's going from your wallet and it's going to Bob's Cafe. But what changes is the, the script and the signature, the signature changes in a very subtle way. And the only effect of that is to modify the fingerprint, so the transaction ID. Now you have two transactions. You have the one that the user's wallet created with transaction ID A, and then you have someone else who sees that transaction, creates a competing transaction that has all of the same details except for a slight change in the way the signature is written, and it comes out to have transaction ID or fingerprint B. You can't set the transaction ID. The transaction ID is not actually part of the transaction. It's not in the transaction. Transaction ID is calculated from the transaction, and it's calculated by everyone who sees it. So what you're doing is you're just changing the signatures so what everybody calculates as a transaction ID is different. So you have two competing transactions, A and B, both of which bend the same UTXO, the same inputs. They both create the same outputs. They both create the same fee. They pay the same person the same amount. 
but they're identified differently. And the end result is that you have two problems. One problem is kind of the naive wallet problem, the one you described with Gox, which is if you're looking to see whether a transaction has been confirmed on the blockchain by looking for the transaction ID, you will miss this. That's not the right way to check if a transaction has been confirmed. The canonical way to check whether a transaction has been confirmed is to look at the UTXO that transaction is spending and see if the UTXO has been spent. And that's how you should do it, because basically, until the transaction is confirmed, its ID is not known, is not trusted. But you can always check the UTXO, and if the UTXO hasn't been spent, it's not in there, and if it has been spent, then it's there. So until you have one confirmation, you cannot make any statements or comparisons based on transaction ID, because it's malleable, right? So that's a problem really for naive wallets and naive implementations of uh, trying to see if something has confirmed or not. But there's an even deeper problem. And the deeper problem has to do with chained transactions. So let's say you're doing a series of transactions where one transaction spends the change from the previous transaction, right? Let's say, for example, you have a, an off blockchain exchange that's trying to do a lot of withdrawals for a lot of customers. Or let's say that you distribute 1,500 uh, unique amounts of uh, LTB coin on yes. a perla weekly basis, and you used to chain all of those transactions, yes. Right, so what happens when you do that? Well, there's two ways to do that. One way is to pay customer A, get the change back, wait until that's confirmed, and then use the change, the confirmed change, to pay customer B, wait till that's confirmed, use the change that's confirmed to pay customer C, etc. If you did it that way, you'd be looking at 10 minutes for each customer, and if you had 1,500 customers, you'd have to wait 15,000 minutes, which might be a bit of a problem. So instead, what most systems that are trying to do a lot of transactions uh, like that do, is they create a transaction to pay customer A, and they then create a transaction to pay customer B from the change from customer A, and C, D, E, F, G, etc. And they chain all of these transactions together and send them so that they can get confirmed in a single block as a single package of chain transactions. So when a miner sees it, they see the parent, the child, the grandchild, the great grandchild, etc. as a sequence of chain transactions, and they confirm all of them together in the same block. And that works great. The problem is that the child transaction, any one of these children transaction, has to refer to the parent transaction change output in order to spend it. So customer B, who's spending the change from A, has to refer to transaction A somehow. And the way it refers to transaction A is by the transaction ID. But of course, this is an unconfirmed transaction. So if your transaction A gets malleated on root and instead gets a new transaction ID, let's call it A1, now the transaction for B refers to A and A doesn't exist. So B is an orphan. And not only is B an orphan, but because B is an orphan, so is C and D and E and F and G, and your entire chain is orphaned and sits around forever. At this point, you have to create a new chain called B1, C1, D1, E1, which refers to the parent that actually did confirm, but you can only do that after the parent is confirmed. As soon as you do that, someone malleates B1 and changes it to B2. Now your entire chain from C1, D1, E1 is also invalid, and you have to resubmit it. So you're back now to only submitting chains one by one after each transaction is confirmed, 15,000 minutes for 1,500 customers. So this really, really disrupts any application that requires chained transactions, and a lot of applications require chaining of transactions. In fact, one of the fascinating solutions I saw that someone proposed, which is actually causes a, an even bigger mess on the blockchain, is to simultaneously submit all possible variants of the transaction. <laughs> so to submit a chain where you have transaction A, and then you have B, B1, B2, B3, B4, and then chained underneath that C, C1, C2, C3, C4, etc., but in order to do that, you'd have to have one transaction for A, two transactions for B, four transactions for C, eight transactions for D, 16 transactions for E, etc. And if you want to chain 10 customers in a row, you need 1,024 transactions 
to express all of the variants, or 2 to the n. And that creates an explosion in the number of transactions that you're sending out into the mempool. This is really creating quite a mess. As I mentioned, I understand it better now that it's affecting me, but clearly I still don't have a very good understanding of it. When somebody is engaging in this attack, are they actually creating new transactions themselves, or are they just broadcasting a modified version of the one that they actually got that is the real transaction? Are they able to modify it? Or is they're, it a new one? They're broadcasting a modified version of the transaction, the real transaction that they so received. So it doesn't even cost them a transaction fee per attack or per hit? Well, absolutely not. Because for, first of all, they can't create a transaction to malleate yours because they don't have keys to sign for your outputs. You have the keys. They can't sign as you. What they can do is change your signature slightly so that it messes the fingerprint. So they receive your transaction. And they look at that transaction and then they modify the signature and retransmit it so that it has a different ID. And if theirs gets propagated faster, and they have ways of ensuring that by transmitting it to specific nodes directly, then theirs will get confirmed into the blockchain and yours won't. Both of them have your signature on your outputs spending to your desired destination and you're paying the fee. The only difference is the signature on the two transactions is just slightly different. So what we wound up doing with the LTB distributor is rather than doing those chain transactions as you were describing, which, was, which is how we had done it for the last year and a half, the system now effectively uh, generates a unique UTXO in advance for every transaction that needs to go out. And on the uh, SwapBot vending machine side, we've basically completely eliminated uh, using transaction IDs in the system to identify these transactions and instead have kind of our own metric based on what we know about the transactions, since we're the ones creating them and stuff like that. So that's kind of been the interesting thing is that I think that this is being fixed in core. I know it's been partly fixed in core already. Today, actually, release 11.1 came out today. We're doing this recording on October 15th. Release uh, 10.1 came out today. And one of the things it does is it does not relay variants of a transaction that use a variant of the signature based on high or low S values. So I believe it now only relays low S values and not high S values. To explain what this means, when you create a digital signature, you use a, a value inside the signature which is called S. And that's one of the things you use for the signature on the transaction. That value can come in two variants. It can be a low value or it can be a high value to make it really, really simple. Assume that a signature that has the value 1, 2, or 3 for S is interpreted the same as a signature that has the values 1001, 1002, 1003 for S. So let's say you transmit a signature that has S as 5, and then the attacker, what they do is they take your transaction, they change the S value to 1005, and retransmit it. Now the signature evaluates exactly the same because the system previously would take 5 and 1005 as S values to be equivalent. But the hash, the identifier for that transaction is now completely different because of that change in value. So the end result is this was a very easy and uh, quick way to introduce malleability into the system. Now basically the system no longer interprets both values as valid. I think it only takes the low S value if you signed with 5, that would be great. If someone transmitted that with a S value of 1,005, then that would not be relayed and would not be accepted. So the malleated transactions actually fail to propagate. By the way, when I say 5 and 1,005, I'm just using a, an approximation integer. Actually, it's a, it's a hex number with a lot of Fs on the beginning and a very, very long number that's the increment for high S values. Is there any circumstance under which somebody would have a legit reason for wanting to change the transaction ID and propagate that? like, Or is it just strictly an attack thing? Is there any reason to do it that's not malicious, I guess? Well, you, you've got to realize that this is not their own transactions. They're modifying other people's transactions. Uh, the only reason for this is nuisance. But here's the other bizarre effect here. And some of the people who have been doing these transactions and have posted about why they're doing these transactions come up with a very interesting rationale behind this. What happened, Adam, when you were faced with malleability issues that were messing up your business? We had to deal with it. 
And you change this, and you rewrote your wallet not to rely on transactions IDs, but instead to rely on looking at whether UTXO has been spent, and chaining transactions, constructing transactions in a way that uses unique UTXO per transaction, instead of chaining transactions with change. In effect, what happened is you improved your wallet to be resilient to malleability. And the only reason you did that is because you were exposed to malleability. So the argument goes like this. We have these problems. They're known problems, but nobody's fixing them. Nobody's fixing them because there's not enough reason to fix them. But if we start injecting these malleated transactions, we're giving everyone a reason to fix their software. And guess what they're doing? They're fixing their software. So the system actually gets more resilient. Now Bitcoin Core addresses this particular avenue of malleability. We've actually seen now three or four different avenues of malleability be closed down. The total set of malleability, known malleability issues is described in BIP62. BIP62 has nine different broad categories of malleability that can exist in Bitcoin, of which at the moment, I think only three have been addressed, and BIP62 hasn't been fully implemented. And so the question is, why has BIP62 not been implemented? And the reason is because it's painful to implement, and the cost of not implementing it isn't high enough. Well, arguably, the people who are doing these malleability attacks are increasing the cost of not implementing it until it reaches a point where people implement it. And the end result is that Bitcoin becomes more resilient and robust against these kinds of attacks. Do we want to have this pain now? Or do we want to have this pain in two years? when this is used even more broadly by even more people, and the pain ends up creating an even bigger mess. So there's a perverse situation here whereby, yes, this is just a nuisance attack. Yes, the attacker gains absolutely nothing by doing this. But in a way, you can see this little perverse rationale that says, if I poke at the hole in the system, it forces people to patch that hole, which actually improves Bitcoin. Thanks for listening to episode 258 of Let's Talk Bitcoin. Content for today's show was provided by Andreas, Stephanie, and Adam. Music for this episode was provided by Jared Rubens. This episode was edited by Adam B. Levine.